Alrighty, and I believe we are streaming live. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of a delay. I just saw it on on the page. Yep. But, uh, um, yeah. Uh, good evening, um, and thank you all so much uh, for joining us for this uh, discussion. Uh, my name is uh, Delegate uh, Harry Bandari. I represent District Eight, uh, and I serve on the Health and Government Operations Committee, and I do serve on uh, Education Subcommittee for Baltimore County. Uh, I know that uh, BCPS is a huge school system and you are all very busy. Uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to answer some questions uh, from me and our communities here in Northeast uh, Baltimore uh, County. Uh, thank you to Dr. Roberts and his staff uh, for preparing an update on the progress of new elementary school uh, here in our district. Uh, they are here at the corner of Gum, uh, Spring Road and Rossville Bluebird, and for doing their best to answer all the questions that are bound to come uh, with uh, any new school construction. Uh, as for the issues of classroom overcrowding, I know uh, there is no uh, easy fix for this, but I hope after tonight, uh, we will all have a better sense of what BCPS is doing to address this challenge. Uh, my thanks as well to our Board of Education members uh, who represents um, our district, uh, who took the time to join us tonight. Uh, Ms. Han, Ms. Jose, and Ms. Aro. I'm so glad to see you and look forward uh, to uh, hearing your suggestions uh, and comments, uh, both for, <coughs> for myself and my colleagues um, in the uh, legislature. Uh, before we hear, uh, uh, more from uh, Dr. Uh, Roberts uh, uh, and then get to your question. Uh, do you think you could each briefly introduce our board members, yourself or any one watching who may not uh, be in the habit of tuning into school uh, board meeting? Um, yeah, uh, Miss Hen. Thank you, Delegate Bandari, and thank you for having me tonight and inviting me. It's an honor to participate in this town hall. Um, so thank you, and good evening to everyone um, joining us tonight. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Perry Hall and of the Northeast, and um, school overcrowding has been a concern of mine since long before I've been on the board. I've been a parent of two children who have gone through Baltimore County Public Schools, both of whom have gone through um, Perry Hall schools in particular, and so overcrowding is a personal concern of mine as both a parent and as a board member. And I have advocated along with Councilman Marks, who sends his regrets, he would very much have liked to have been here tonight um, for new schools, for relief for our schools. And I appreciate your efforts, um, particularly in the legislature to advance our capital funding. Um, for these school projects that are, um, I'm very pleased to see moving forward, both with the Northeast Elementary Schools and the Northeast Middle School. So it's, it's exciting to see these projects moving forward. Um, it's exciting to have the support, as always, of our friends in Annapolis um, to lobby for that, that funding, as well as our county, county partners. And again, I'll, I'll keep my remarks brief, but thank you for including me tonight and look forward to the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Jazz. Thank you, Delegate Bhandari, and thank you, Jacob, for inviting me to this town hall. My name is Molly Jose. I'm a member at large for the Baltimore County Board of Education, and I've been on the board for about three years. I live in Perry Hall, and both of my children attend uh, Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, living in Perry Hall for about 20 years now, and uh, my son attended Perry Hall Middle, which is severely overcrowded. So. I know as a parent and as a board member, um, the concerns of overcrowding and the issues related uh, with overcrowding. But just recently, uh, Delegate Pandari and other delegates joined us. We had the groundbreaking for our new Northeast Elementary. Um, so that was really exciting. And um, I also serve as, um, I also am a civil engineer. So planning and capital planning is close to my heart. And I'm really excited that Delegate Bhandari, who's an educator himself, is advocating for education. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Roberts, for being here as well, for representing Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Then oh. Ms. Rowe, is she here? I don't believe Ms. Rowe yet. Yeah. 
yeah, hope uh, she will join. Perfect. And thank you all again to kick things off. I would like to share a little bit about myself and why I wanted to host this uh, discussion. Uh, anyone who knows me knows how important education is to me. Uh, I'm a lifelong student and teacher. Uh, my grandfather actually dedicated his life to building a school in my hometown in Nepal. And my dad took over running the school when I was young. In addition to pursuing my own education, which by the way, I'm super excited to be finishing up my PhD research at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I've always worked as a teacher. And I really believe that raising the next generation uh, to be brilliant leaders, uh, thinkers, creator, and innovator is the most important legacy uh, we can leave. And we lay the foundation for that legacy every day in the classroom. The American public education system is one of our strongest asserts as a nation. Our educators really are heroes and have such a critical impact on our kids. Our school leaders play a key part in shaping the classroom experience for our students. And we must recognize the incredibly challenging nature of doing that work on such a wide scale, especially through the last couple of years. BCPS is a huge system. I said uh, before, uh, well over 100,000 students. And it takes a lot to manage all that. So to the educators and school leaders with us tonight or watching this later, thank you so much. I wanted to focus particularly on the issues of classroom overcrowding because that is something I've heard many concerns about from parents in my district. My district is growing with new development, bringing new families, and that has led to further strain on classroom uh, capacity. Um, and, and that led to further strain on classroom capacity. Um, again, I repeat, as a teacher myself, I know how hard it can be um, to, to manage uh, a classroom um, and uh, educate um, our children uh, for, uh, uh, for the future. Um, and this town hall, uh, I, I believe, will give a sense where we stand. Uh, and in addition to getting an update and asking some questions about new elementary school, I want to look even further ahead uh, to have a robust discussion about the issues which will have, uh, in my opinion, the biggest impact on students and families uh, in our areas over the coming years. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Roberts to share any remarks uh, he has prepared. And again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for joining us tonight, uh, Dr. Roberts. Wonderful. Thank you, Delegate Bondari, for that wonderful introduction, very sincere introduction. And thank you for your service as an educator um, locally and, and throughout your life. And certainly um, extended thanks to our Vice Chair Hen and Board Member Joes for their participation. Um, staunch advocates, not just for the Perry Hall area um, and for District 5, um, but certainly for all of Baltimore County Public Schools and all of our students. So um, I do have some opening comments, but just a little bit of context, delegate, and for, for our listeners. Um, I currently serve as community superintendent for East Zone Schools in Baltimore County. i um, been fortunate to serve in that position for six years now. And the Perry Hall um, feeder pattern, as well as all the schools down to Edgemere, I've had the privilege of working with for these six years. Um, and before that, I had the distinct privilege of serving as principal of Perry Hall High School. Um, so I've worked um, directly for the students within your district um, for at least the last 14 years and, and being almost a 20 year resident of District 5, living in Towson for almost 20 years. You know, certainly know your district and know the district very well and has a very um, close place in my heart, um, just having worked in it. Um, and still being part of it and working with the children and the community members. So thank you for inviting me. Um, certainly on behalf of Dr. Williams and BCPS, um, thank you for inviting us and giving us an opportunity to share some information. Um, had the opportunity to receive some questions from Mr. Tuke earlier. Um, so I'm just going to, what I'd like to do, Delegate Bandari, if you're okay with this, just kind of run through the questions yeah. um, and just kind of share a little bit about each of the questions. And then from that point, if there's any additional follow-up questions you would have, um, then certainly I will provide as many answers as I can. If I'm not able to answer them um, from you or from any of the community members, then certainly um, I will loop back with your staff and we'll see if we can get those answers for you um, and provide, provide those to the community as I work with my colleagues within the school system. 
Um, so we have the information that you and your um, constituents would like to have as we move forward. So one of the first questions that was shared was around the status of the new elementary school. You certainly touched on it a few times in your opening comments, and that is a very, very worthwhile comment. And we are super excited to be opening the new Northeast Elementary School. Um, you know, I, I certainly remember back in 2007, you know, overcrowding in the Perry Hall feeder pattern and working with Councilman Marks um, and Ms. Hen when she was on the Northeast Advisory Council. You know, we were talking about overcrowding, not just in the high school, but in the area, and really talking about the prospect of new elementary schools, new middle schools, new high schools, new schools in general within the Perry Hall White Marsh um, within your constituent area. So we're excited that the new elementary school is on track. Um, just as recently as last night, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later around the boundary process for the new Northeast Elementary School. We had a boundary meeting last night. Um, it was the first opportunity where the public had an opportunity to see the two recommendations that the committee has been working extremely hard um, in, in providing and really delving into the communities that are going to be impacted by the boundary process and really brought forward last night the first of, of two recommendations that the community will be able to provide input on. But I'll, I'll put a pin in that for right now and give more detail on that in a moment. But in that presentation, uh, Mr. Jennings, Kevin Jennings, who is, was appointed the new principal of the new Northeast Elementary School, he is a, a veteran principal, but he is going to be the principal of the new school. Um, he shared with the community that the school is at 33% completion, which is exactly where um, facilities and the plan has it being at this moment in time. So um, we are on track at a third, a little over a third completion. So everything is moving forward as scheduled with the construction. Um, the principal in terms of staffing, I know there's a couple of questions we'll talk about a little bit later around staffing in general, but the principal, Mr. Jennings, has already had two information sessions, one of them at Golden Ring Middle School and one of them as recently as yesterday at Milford Mill Academy. For any current interested teachers or staff within Baltimore County Public Schools who may want to apply, um, for the new Northeast Elementary School. And that follows along the typical process that we have when we open a new school, whether it be elementary or middle or high school. Um, the, the principal will go out and hold interest meetings, share some of the schematics, some of the pictures, really drum up some, some interest um, in, in the new school, talk about the new school, talk about, in this case, Mr. Jennings' his vision for the new school. So it has some really good turnout, some positive turnout at Golden Ring and at Milford Mill Academy over these two interest sessions. So I know Mr. Jennings would say this if he were here, that he is really excited um, about the interest that is being shown in the school and looking forward to building um, his staff, very similar to Ms. Benke when she built her staff at our most recent elementary school, Honeygo Elementary School in um, the Perry Hall area. So as far as some other um, logistics that Mr. Jennings is involved in, um, ordering furniture. So that is a process. It, it, it's something that most people wouldn't think about, but it's something that the principal has to be involved in. So it just doesn't appear. So Mr. Jenny is really working um, very hard in ordering the furniture, ordering the equipment, all the things that need to go into the school and really tailoring it to the space and tailoring it to what his vision is for the school with respect to um, not just the other, the other educational specifications for all our new schools that open, but really trying to tailor it to um, his vision for the school. So he works very closely with BCPS project managers. He works with the construction firms. He works with the architects on every aspect of the school. So that's really kind of the status of where we are at the new elementary school. If you were to drive by it, you mentioned earlier between Rossville and Gum Spring, you would see the scaffolding is up. The steel girders are up. I mean, you can really start seeing the layout of the school, um, the parking lot. So you every day and almost every week, you see a new piece of completion. And as long as the weather holds out and, and everything stays on track, you'll really see some noticeable differences as you drive by the site or any community member drives by the site over the upcoming months. So that's where we are with the school. There was a related question around the traffic patterns, road construction, other developments in the neighborhood. And that's where, if I can, I'm gonna try this. Um, See if I can share the screen and hopefully this works. If it doesn't, then uh, it should work. Okay, can you see that map? All right, Mr. Tews, give me the thumbs up. Okay, so instead of just kind of explaining it in, in hypotheticals and everyone trying to imagine, I went to the October 20th and this is for the public. Um, this presentation was provided to the Buildings and Contracts Committee, I believe on October 20th, 2020. 
is the date. Um, you can see it's a Vimeo. So Baltimore County Public Schools hosts a Vimeo page where all of our board meetings and all videos and, and really where it's a, a repository of our uh, videos and our meeting minutes for the Board of Education and other meetings that are held on Vimeo. So this is public and it's about halfway through the building and contracts committee. So any one of your participants or constituents or participants in this meeting, when I really go back and listen to the background of this, because this is about a year old, at this point, when this was presented to the Board of Education, um, they can certainly feel free to do that at their leisure. I wanted to focus on this because I think this gets to the heart, Delegate, of what you were asking in that question. So I don't have a kind of a finger pointer, unfortunately, but you can see on, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see Gump Spring Road is labeled here, Gump Spring Road right here. And the main entrance is going to be coming off of, and you see where it says Main Entry Drive, coming off of Gum Spring Road. And these yellow, just give you a little bit of understanding of these yellow arrows. These yellow arrows indicate the travel for the buses as well as service. So this part here is the front of the school. These spaces will be staff parking right here. So as the buses pull up, they will drop children off and then they will continue around the school and they will also drop children off. They will actually drop children off in the back of the school well, they will enter. So they're safe from any of the traffic, the parent drop off or the staff parking. So really when you see new designs of schools, they separate um, staff and parent parking and traffic from bus traffic for obvious safety reasons for the kids. So the, the buses will come around, drop off the children. Um, this is kind of a see-through or pass-through right here in the school. And then the buses will continue and you will see this is Rossville Boulevard. There was early discussion if, if back when the design, uh, the community did raise points around not having buses or service vehicles make a left onto Gum Spring. Anyone, all of us who know this area know Rossville is not a road you probably wanna be making a left on during rush hour in the morning or the afternoon. Or, so it's hard to see here, but there's a little median right here. So as traffic is coming down Rossville, okay, there'll be after certain hours, right? Because we don't want that, that traffic colliding. Um, so between the drop off and the pickup times, traffic can just come into the school, but when there's drop off or pickup, buses and service vehicles will come out, exit onto the, onto the way of traffic and to the right of way and continue along their way. So this is the basic traffic pattern that you'll see and parents can drop off in this area, drop off in the front of the school, and then they will loop out as well. There's a little bit of conversation. Once the boundaries are set, delegate, and for the participants, once we know exactly how many children and where those children are coming from, transportation will then design their bus routes. There, I've heard there could be some conversation with the county government around maybe putting some traffic lights, certainly crossing guards, looking and exploring crossing guards, um, potentially here at Gum Spring. There's also gonna be a sidewalk. If you see a really light tan dotted line, that's a, walk, that's a sidewalk. So students who would walk, who potentially would walk because we don't have the boundary set yet, there will be a safe sidewalk for them to walk onto the property and then cross safely. So there is some conversation about maybe some traffic measures, um, calming measures or lights that could be placed possibly on Gum Spring or other areas to facilitate traffic flow. So this is the layout of the school. You see the ball fields um, and where the school is situated, but I, want, I figured this would be easier just to see kind of how the traffic will flow and the community can see based, you know, certainly where they live, if they live in the immediate vicinity um, or if they're traveling to the school. So I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to, Okay, so I should have stopped sharing. All right, so another question was, how will the new school affect bus routes, concerns of overcrowding? So I touched upon that in my comments just a moment ago. So once the boundary process, and I'll talk a little more specifically about the boundary process in a moment, because I know that was a question that's coming up. Transportation will create bus routes that are the most efficient bus routes to safely transport children to the new school and from the new school. Clearly, under current transportation guidelines and parameters when we're talking about number of students on a bus, um, whether buses need to have aids and so forth. This will be a regional special education center for some special education programs. So if there are any buses that require additional adults on it, that'll all be um, configured by transportation to under our existing parameters in terms of number of students who are allowed on a bus. 
Um, so that will be finalized. We're looking at about the spring. Once the Board of Education formally votes on the boundary, which will be in February of 2022, then transportation will take their cue and then start actually routing out buses um, and providing the adequate coverage um, for those schools. And as well, we can't forget, there are seven schools who are part of the who are part of the process for the rezoning. So it's not just the new Northeast Elementary School that is gonna to have to have their transportation, but we're talking Shady Spring, we're talking Elmwood, Joppa View, Perry Hall Elementary. So there'll be some adjustments to those bus routes as well, because obviously children will be coming from all of those schools. So the community can expect, and as we do every year, that information is shared with the community and will be at the same time um, as it has been, so the parents can plan, they can see those bus stops, and we can work through any questions the community has. So. Moving forward, there was a question um, submitted around, uh, do we have enough teachers and staff? And what is BCPS doing to recruit? Now, I'm not sure if the question was really related to the new school or in general. So I'm gonna kind of address it both ways um, for the participants. So on, ma on the macro level, certainly BCPS still does have current vacancies as does every LEA in the state. And, and, and we all know that on this line and certainly all your participants on the call would recognize that every county in Maryland and, and almost everyone um, within our region has vacancies. So that being said, our HR department is working extremely hard um, as they always do and will continue to do to fill those vacancies and working with our school principals. So some of, the, some of the examples of what they're doing, they're continually vetting and interviewing qualified applicants. So as, as um, potential teachers apply or staff for that matter, then HR is vetting, making sure that they meet the qualifications for the job they're applying for. If they do, moving them through the process of interviewing, getting them into a pool, if there is a pool of candidates for that particular position, and then referring them to principals um, for interviewing. So that's really an ongoing 365 day a week or 365 day a year process. In addition, we've certainly our communications team has done a phenomenal job of publicizing on various fairs, job fairs. So we most recently have a job fair for retired teachers. So teachers who have retired and you know what, have the itch again and say, hey, I wanna get back in there and I wanna get back in front of kids and I wanna teach, I wanna contribute. There will be a specific job fair just for them. So really excited about that and bringing back and, and re-engaging our, our retired teachers um, and really leveraging their expertise and passion um, for kids and for teaching. Um, also career changers. We know that there are folks who are you know, engineers who may say, you know what, I wanna teach. I wanna, I wanna provide my knowledge and really put forward and, and share what I know from my professional experience as a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year engineer or whatever field it may be, and I wanna teach. So they will apply and HR will work with them on getting the proper certifications, if there's any coursework, reviewing their college transcripts, really working with them to make sure that they not only have the proper credentials and can earn them, but then get them in front of kids um, once they go through that process. So that's another thing that, that our HR department is doing, our schools are doing. We have paraeducators. So we know one of the programs that um, has started um, previously was how do we take paraeducators who have been paraeducators and leverage that experience and that passion who say, you know what, I wanna teach. So what we are doing is, is for paraeducators actively going out and actively saying to them, here is a pathway for you. Here's a pathway for you to become a certificated teacher, full-time teacher. Now let us help you do that. So, those, so it's not just a matter of us sitting back and waiting for these folks to come to us. We are actively providing through schools, through principals, through our website, um, an opportunity to give a pathway for our paraeducators to achieve their teacher certification. And then lastly, some of the other regular things that we do, um, but just as important are the local and regional college visits. Our HR team is out at University of Maryland College Park, Towson, without a doubt, um, our largest supplier of teachers, um, Frostburg, Salisbury, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, so in Maryland, regionally in Delaware, West Virginia, but also along the East Coast, um, really looking at and tapping into um, our teaching colleges and getting those potential graduates in December, coming up on a December graduation time, um, and as well as the May graduation to interview at job fairs, offer advanced contracts, and really um, kind of lock in those prospective teachers early, excuse me, and welcoming them to Maryland um, or keeping them in Maryland depending on what the situation is. So that's kind of what we're doing on a macro level and then on a micro level um, at the schools. Um, 
then kind of going back to how parents can weigh in. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, boundary process. Some of your constituents submitted questions. Just kind of how does that work? And that's a fair question. That's part of what you saw last night or you can see. All the boundary meetings are um, taped. They are first virtual. They are live. So anyone can watch them in real time. Or if they're not able to, they can watch them um, via tape. So the first public hearing session was held last night, as I mentioned earlier, at Middle River Middle School. That is where the committee is meeting. The committees are made up of uh, teachers and uh, parents from each of the seven schools that are participating in the boundary. So you have a principal, you're going to have two parents, and you're going to have a teacher from each one of the schools that's represented, for the exception, obviously, of the new Northeast Elementary, because that's why we're there. They don't have yet that community to draw from. But all the schools that are impacted have provided um, those participants. The, pr the principals are not voting members. So it's important to know this process is, is um, run under board policy and rules. So it's laid out very specific um, based on the board policy and the superintendent's rule of how a school boundary process occurs. It is extremely transparent. And we are very proud here in Baltimore County that our school boundary process, in my opinion, is, is probably the most transparent, and I would say is the most transparent boundary process of any LEA, um, and, and really proud of the work that our team in strategic planning um, and business services and our school principals do and our community does, um, as well as our Board of Education, to really make sure that our parents and our community have input on this process. So last night, they were presented with two, um, and that information can be found on our website, it's right kind of towards the middle of the website. You can click on, it says new Northeast boundary, click on that and all the meetings are there. All the minutes are there. The videos are there. Um, there are links to questions. There are links to the survey that opened this morning on the two recommended, or at least right now, the two preliminary recommended boundaries are there for the community to review, um, submit questions, submit comments and offer their input. And that's just the first round of community input. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So as we move forward with that, well, now that the boundary process has proposed two boundaries, there's a survey for the next two weeks that the community can access and offer their input. That input is then shared with the committee on December 1st, that's our next meeting. Um, so we give the community two weeks time to digest, process, ask their questions, provide their input. All of that will then be provided to the committee on Wednesday, December 1st at Middle River. They will then digest all of those recommendations, and then they will dive back into those boundaries, those recommended boundaries. Do we keep them the same? What do the community say? Do we want to make an adjustment here? And they're going to wrestle with that, and they're going to talk with each other, and then they're going to come back, and they're going to ultimately lead to a recommendation, a formal recommendation, um, and per policy and rule, um, the community superintendent and Matt Cropper, who's, the, who's our partner in this work and has done this process for us for many, many, many years. He knows our county very well. Um, so the community superintendent and Matt Cropper will sit and present um, the formal recommendation on February 2022 to the Board of Education, where then the board will have a chance to ask questions. The board will then go out and have their own public hearing sessions. So when we talk about public process and transparency, so now we have this process. The board will then sit and listen to the community. Then the board will go and deliberate. And then ultimately in February, and that happens in January. So then in February, the Board of Education will ultimately have final deliberations, make a vote or have a vote, and then a formal boundary will be created um, if all goes well, February 2022. Dr. Uh, Dr. Oh, Roberts, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but I just wanted to note, I, I saw from the slides from the meeting last night that a version of that survey you mentioned that's open yes. for the next two weeks is actually available in Nepalese. I, I just wanted to note that in case anyone is viewing this Absolutely. and might feel more comfortable participating in Nepalese language. I just wanted to kind of throw that out. Great point. Thank you for reminding me of that. It is translated into multiple languages and Nepalese is one of them. Um, so, so again, kudos to our communications team um, and our staff at DRAA for really um, doing the, the work to, and rightly so, to translate those documents for our entire community. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, there was a question here around the naming of the school. Um, so that is a, that is a, uh, that's always a kind of a fun part about naming the school. Um, and again, Kudos to our Board of Education, um, who has always 
um, kept in continuing the process for transparency, um, community involvement. So not only is the boundary process extremely transparent, but also the naming is transparent. So if, you, if anyone wants to look up the process, it's board policy and rule 7520, 7520. And that outlines, not a long policy, not a long policy and not a long rule, it's pretty straightforward, but it is very clear. The community will have input and provide suggestions. So really that process has already begun. The behind the scenes work has already begun. Our goal is to have um, an initial survey out within the next, uh, probably the next four weeks or so, an initial survey out. Mr. Tu, to your point, translated. Um, so all of our community can participate. And it's a simple question. What would you like the new name of the school to be? Um, and I'm paraphrasing, it won't be that, that um, simplistic of a question, but that's the heart of it. What would you like it to be? And the community will be able to type in what they would like the name of the school to be. So when we did this with Honeygo in 2017, um, it was, we had about 350 recommended names. I mean, the community really dove into this um, and provided, um, again, about 350 names. Some of them were repetitive or variations on a theme, but it was great involvement by the Perry Hall community for naming ultimately Honeygo Elementary. So we anticipate the same thing for our new Northeast. After the community has that initial um, input, we will then, our team will narrow it down to the top two choices. And then those top two choices will then go back out to the community. And the community will have an opportunity to, to vote on there from the top two. So we'll have a number one and a number two. And then again, per policy and rule, what I will do in the winter of 2022 for Honeygo, it was around February of 2018. So we're targeting about that same time to keep that consistency. So in the winter of 2022, um, I would bring forward on behalf of the superintendent um, the recommended name for the new Northeast Elementary. And of course, what I would do as I've done in the past is show the board, here are, here are the top um, two names and here's how many votes this same got, here's how many votes this same got. But certainly the board would wanna know, was it like a clear cut favor? Was it like by one vote? And so the, and then we'll engage in a Q and A with the Board of Education then ultimately they will deliberate as it did with the boundary and they will make a final vote on the new name and then all the signage can go ahead and be made and then put up on the school um, in time for the opening in August of 2020. So getting down to the last few questions, what I did um, delegate is I kind of combined these next two questions. When we're talking about the $2.2 billion school construction, construction projects, the Build to Learn Act, um, what are the top priorities for Baltimore County? How will spending on new construction impact these budgets? and what's the status of the new Northeast Elementary in the timeline. So I kind of, I condensed these together. Um, and what I will say about all of these is the most immediate impact of the Build to Learn Act um, will be the construction of the new Northeast Middle School. Um, and I think Ms. Hen mentioned it a little bit earlier and she has been a staunch advocate for the new Northeast Middle um, for as long as I've known her, you know, as far as early, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, and her advocacy um, in the Perry Hall community. So this is now coming to fruition, and this is going to be the most immediate impact, Delegate Bendari, for you and your constituents in your area. So the design, what I can share with you at this point is the design for the new Northeast Middle School um, is in the final stages of completion, um, and it is anticipated to be bid um, soon. I don't have exact dates, um, and that would be, you know, that would be follow up with our team with Mr. Dixit and his team and facilities. Um, but in meeting with him on this topic recently, um, we are in the final stages, his team's in the final stages and they do anticipate to put the bid out. So that's exciting, that's a huge step. Um, and I know he and his team are excited for that. And then the additional funds, so this goes to the $2.2 .2 billion um, under the Kerwin Commission. Those funds will be available in the near future to support the Build to Learn initiative. Um, and so construction should start um, from facilities point of view, construction should start on the new Northeast Middle in 2022. So Mr. Dixit um, wanted me to share that with all of you. So he's anticipating um, kind of breaking ground, if you will, um, somewhere in 2022. So certainly that's still a, a you know, fluid situation, but that's the information that he wanted me to share with, with the community um, and targeting kind of those, those rough dates for the new Northeast Middle. Um, and then the opening, if it would, to break ground in 2022, then we're probably looking at a two or three year process um, for the new middle school, because that's a much larger school than, than an elementary school. So um, another question related to the new construction, how will it help address overcrowding in the classroom? It's a great question. 
um, and what steps remain to fully address the issue. So I can share some numbers with you, some data with you. Um, and this is all, again, publicly available. The construction of the new Northeast Elementary will add over 700 seats to the area. So when we're talking about the seven schools in the boundary process now, the children will be drawn from those seven schools and the redistricting will occur to ultimately provide and to fill the 700 new seats at the new Northeast Elementary while getting to the heart of the question, lowering, right? So we look at Perry Hall, again, Perry Hall Elementary, Joppa View Elementary, Elmwood, Fullerton, Shady Spring, um, though in other schools, they will lower their capacity as well and get them um, closer to where they should be um, or below where they should be in, in, in many cases. And that's part of what the boundary committee is doing and some of the data that they look at to provide recommendation. So in addition to that, when we look at um, the new construction, we can't forget Red House Run. We have a new Red House Run that's being built in the, in the Northeast area. And that is, and that's another exciting project that is being built on the same site as the current Red House Run. Um, that's gonna add over 300 seats approximately to the area. And again, when we're adding seats at Red House Run, we're going to, again, lower capacity. So that's another, so that's right there, those two projects are a thousand seats at the elementary level. Now we talk about the new Northeast middle. We can't forget too, that there's also an addition scheduled at Pine Grove. So the new Northeast middle is right now, based on my last conversation with strategic planning, about 1400 seats um, in the Northeast area for the middle school. Pine Grove would add an additional 200 seats um, to the area. Now, Pine Grove, again, and this is, again, public information. This has been shared at, at previous board meetings over the years, since this has been a topic over many years. That's going to be a multi-phase process because Pine Grove, it's not just the Northeast, but it's also Ridgely Middle. It's some of the central area schools, Dumbarton, Ridgely School. It's going to, that's going to be a larger process. Um, but again, when we're talking about seats being added around 1400 by the new school, about 200 by the Pine Grove. Um, and then again, the boundary process will dictate where children come from, how many go here, who stayed. So all of that will be dealt with the same way it is for the new Northeast Elementary. For the other questions, I would direct the community to the My iPass study. Um, so the My iPass study is publicly available. It is on the bcps.org website. You can read the entire report or you can read there's a, there's a smaller version of the report as well um, that was updated as of August, 2021. So that's a long-term plan for Baltimore County Public Schools um, and that is available for the community. So I would certainly refer your constituency or anyone participating in this um, and watching the town hall to the My iPass study. Um, it is the most recent study that the county government and the county school system have undergone to address long-term sustainability. Um, of our schools. So related, we talk about, we're getting to the end here, um, the new high school. Uh, so this is invariably the conversation with the new elementary, goes to the new middle and usually ends at the new high school. I get it as the principal of Perry Hall High School, I certainly can appreciate this in, in that area. Um, so here, um, what I can share with you here is a little bit certainly much briefer and that the efforts are underway. This ties back to the My iPass study. So when we talk about the new Northeast or a potential of a new Northeast high school or a high school in the area, um, efforts are underway to study the various options for the new Northeast, um, potentially a new Northeast high school. And in conjunction with that, exploring availability of a site, um, if there were gonna be one for a, a new high school in the area. So I don't have a lot of details beyond that because My iPass really did a lot of work to get underneath that. Um, so I don't have a lot of details there, but if there were any more detailed questions about the potential high school, that again, I would direct to my iPass or we'd have to take that back to our facilities team um, and have Mr. Dixit respond from there. So the very last question from Delegate Bandari was the legislative priorities um, that he would like to be aware of as he enters the session in January. And certainly um, I can appreciate that. What I would say to that Delegate Bandari and, and for your constituents is, we have, um, the process for our operating budget has begun. Um, that really is a year long process, building a, an operating budget for almost $2 billion um, operation. But um, I would direct um, the community to kind of keep, uh, you know, keep a 
watch on the process of the operating budget, right? That is, again, another transparent process. I know our advisory boards, the Northeast Advisory and the Southeast Advisory, which I work very closely with on the east side, they have already held their input meetings from the community. I know from my, co my colleague community superintendents at the central area, Northwest and Southwest, have also held their input sessions for the boundary, pro I'm not the boundary process, for the operating budget for FY23. So I would, uh, I would ask the community to certainly provide input to your, to your area advisory councils and what you feel is, are the priorities as well as monitor the progress. I know the superintendent um, typically will present um, a draft operating budget um, and present to the Board of Education um, in the winter time around January. Then the board takes that budget, deliberates over several meetings and then ultimately makes a final vote. Um, and then that gets passed forward to the county executive for review. And this year, and certainly Ms. Hen can speak in more detail to this, the Board of Education voted and created a budget committee. Um, so, there is, so there's really a lot of good work going on in the Board of Education's budget committee. So we really have um, those two processes going on and all that would tie back to our compass. Um, the, so the superintendent's vision for Baltimore County. So I don't have specifics in terms of real priorities. Now I know last year was a focus on people, uh, people personnel workers, social workers, school counselors, teachers. I uh, really was putting focus on social emotional learning. Um, and now the kids have come back. So that was a priority last year. Um, and again, well, that process will work itself through its normal chain um, as we go through the operating budget. So I hope I hope I didn't take too much time, but I really wanted to make sure I did I did justice to your questions, delegate, um, and provide as much information as I could to your constituency. So I will defer to either Ms. Joes, Ms. Han, or anyone else for any questions or going from here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, would be wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, incredible presentation and information. Uh, regarding our new schools and participating schools and how we are going to best utilize 2.2 billion uh, right. uh, from Build to Learn Act uh, for school uh, construction project. Um, and um, any board member, if you have any question, Ms. Hen, Ms. Joes, um, unfortunately, Ms. Shro, I don't, uh, I have not seen her. Do you have any question? The Delegate Bandari, no questions, but I did want to Thank Dr. Roberts um, for the excellent answers to his questions and reiterate a couple of the points. Um, the boundary study process is something we should all be extremely proud of. Um, if I had to choose a process within BCPS that I would say is an exemplar, that would be the one I would choose. It, as Dr. Roberts said, is extremely transparent. It is extremely inclusive. If anyone listening would like to, any piece of information on the process, go to the website, check it out. You will feel as if you've been on the committee the entire time. Every last detail has been thought of. Cropper does an amazing job at thinking of everything. I am process driven and I, I tell you, I've been um, so impressed that they have thought of every last detail um, down to the presentations are available online. Um, there's an interactive mapping tool where you can look at the boundary options that have been proposed and play with the maps and see how it will affect you down to your street and see um, what the options look like. And as I said, there are multiple options to provide feedback. You can email the board, you can um, answer the survey that's open until the 17th, um, provide feedback at a board meeting by signing up for public comment. I think there are four or five different ways the public can in get involved in the process. Um, listen to the, the meeting recordings that are available. So it is inclusive. It's extremely participative process and it's one that I'm extremely proud of. So I wanted to thank Dr. Roberts for his remarks um, regarding that first and foremost. Um, and there was something else I wanted to add that, that Dr. Roberts touched on, but I'll turn it, I'll let another board member speak or if somebody else has has comments and hopefully um, jog my memory here. So if Ms. Joes um, or Ms. Rowe want to, to chime in, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for the presentation. Uh, also, th thank you, Dr. Delegate Bandari, for this. I do want to tell all the constituents that when you have questions and concerns, please come to the board meetings, write to the board, um, because advocacy matters. And if there are issues in your community regarding school, um, advocacy really, really matters because your community needs to speak up, be more vocal about it. And uh, thank you, Dr. Roberts. He did mention the MyePath study, which is a multi-year study that's the 
done for the first time in Baltimore County. It's never been done before. It prioritized all of our schools and we have 175 schools. Uh, unfortunately, the board did not take all of the recommendations of my past. So I hope that Delegate Bandari in Annapolis, you'll be able to fund all of those schools that need to be built, especially the new Northeast and uh, Perry Hall High School, which is also overcrowded that needs to be addressed. Um, so once again, Dr. Roberts, thank you. Did a good job with the presentation. And um, thank you, Mr. Took, for uh, inviting me as well. And um, this was informative. And again, I always, um, you know, thanks for having me. Thank you. I, I see another board member, uh, Ms. Lily Rowe. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, yeah. uh, Delegate Pandari. Do you want to say something if you have any question to Dr. Roberts or um, anything? You would like to and thank you so much for your continued support all our board members i know how hard you guys work without you, you it would not be possible these new schools and our new participating school elmore fullerton joppa view mccormick perry hall elementary city spring vincent farm these are overcrowded so with all of your support uh we are going to address that uh miss lily uh, Rowe, do you have any questions no, I don't have any questions. You know, I've been advocating for facilities since before even you were in office. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I believe, and we have to stop, like we have to do the hard stop at seven o'clock, Dr. Roberts, it's uh, uh, another appointment. Uh, I, I know uh, the new North Saturday School uh, will be a key step uh, in addressing uh, the concern of overcrowding. It was Red House Run uh, and all the participating uh, school I just named. Uh, and, 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 and thank you uh, tonight uh, uh, giving the update, uh, uh, the status of middle school, even uh, the prospect of a new high school. Uh, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it's wonderful. And I would like to thank all my colleagues in the Maryland General Assembly uh, to pass a Bill to Learn Act and basically my district. Uh, Colleagues, um, our Senator Kathy Klasmer, uh, Delegate Jackson, uh, Delegate Bortler, and we are with uh, good friends with our county executive. Uh, he has been fighting, John Yu, uh, fighting for education, and Councilman uh, David March and Councilwoman uh, uh, Kathy Vevins. We work together. We work together. Uh, and uh, the blueprint for Maryland, as uh, uh, Dr. Roberts uh, mentioned, um, uh, it is a multi billion dollar investment uh, in our school uh, that will give opportunity, hope, and promise to all Maryland uh, students. And um, I, I promise that I will, keep on, uh, I will keep on fighting. And, you know, this is not the full solution. We have to keep on fighting, keep on fighting. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, and we are really blessed um, to have uh, Tony Bessmore. Uh, he always um, help us understand these issues, always comes uh, in Annapolis uh, uh, in our subcommittee meeting and TAPCO as well. Uh, you know, they, they are doing wonderful. Uh, talk, um, Bessmore, you want to say a few words uh, and you will conclude this meeting. And thank you. Uh, I would really appreciate um, uh, your help. Uh, Tony. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Delegate Harry Banderi, for your service and leadership in Annapolis. I truly appreciate your support uh, in Annapolis and your leadership uh, being on the Education Subcommittee. You do a great job representing Baltimore County uh, Public Schools and have been a great, great friend and supporter of ours. And also would like to thank uh, Molly Joes uh, on the school board, uh, Julie Hen, who's the vice chair, and Lily Rowe. They have also been partners in the work that we're all doing. And lastly, I'd just like to thank Dr. Dr. Roberts for his leadership and information tonight, because I, I learned a lot too, Dr. Roberts, you did an excellent job uh, covering um, all the issues and, and uh, uh, we really appreciate your work and your leadership and, and legacy. So as a director of government relations and constituency services, I'm just looking forward Delegate uh, Bandari to another good year. Uh, we know we're implementing the blueprint now, and so we want to keep our eye on that ball because the implementation is the key to, to a lot of this. Certainly the uh, uh, Built to Learn Act and the funding that we're going to get for our capital projects. Uh, we've been waiting for that for a couple of years. It's been stalled for a couple of years, but thank goodness um, that we have that funding now so we can move forward with these legacy projects, these capital legacy projects. 
So again, thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to, uh, to speak. And again, I just want to say to the constituents out there that you have an excellent, excellent team uh, in the district or the council and uh, in our state legislature. And we, we really do all work as a team. So thank you, our delegate, Delegate Pandari, for your leadership. And thank you so much, everybody. As we go to the next session, we are here to listen to our constituents and we'll, we'll, we'll keep on uh, fighting, um, uh, fighting uh, together. And I would like to thank again uh, the entire leadership of uh, BCPS. Uh, I know it is very tough, but uh, you guys have been uh, doing a great job as an educator and as a legislator. Uh, we are uh, really proud of the job uh, you, you have been uh, doing. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for everything. Uh, we are together at the end. Um, no matter if we, we have a wonderful schools, we have a better hospital um, and um, better everything, you know, whether we are Republican, Democrats or no party, it will help our community. That's what my focus is, uh, being a very, very independent voice. And thank you everyone for your support, including Tony Basemer, Dr. Roberts and our board members, if there are anything as we are going to the next session, uh, we are here to help. And thank you, Jacob Took, for putting this together. Uh, yeah, Jacob, you wanna say a few words or we are done, thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't wanna drag it out. There was one actually thing that I had a little follow-up question about from what you said, Dr. Roberts, but feel free to be like, no, I gotta go. But um, you mentioned that the new uh, Northeast Elementary School will be a regional special ed center. Can you just say a couple more words about what exactly that entails? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be um, we, what we refer to as um, social emotional learning support yeah. classrooms. So it's part of the educational specifications for the new Northeast because um, the programs right now are situated in a handful of schools in the area. So yeah. when we have the opportunity to build a new school, and we see that as some of our other elementary schools that have been built, um, when we have an opportunity to bring children together um, to um, in a space that certainly provides and meets needs and meets the needs from the IEP. Um, we wanna make sure that we build as an inclusive school as, as we can. So part of the education specifications were, um, I believe two classrooms, but um, I'd have to go back and double check that um, with our special education department. So they are there. So actually part of the boundary committee meetings, um, Dr. Perendozi, who's our director of special education. She is at and has been at every meeting in representation from special education. Um, so the committee understands exactly to your question. So there have been some questions around the program, the students, what programs they would be coming from to, again, going to Del back to Delegate Bandari's question around relieving some of the capacity of some of the other schools. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not just relief in one area, but it's relief across um, our continuum of services for our students. Um, so really looking forward and exciting to building um, and continuing the um, program offerings um, for all of our students at the new Northeast School. Yeah. Thank you. It's Thank you for indulging me. We'd like to yes. conclude this uh, town hall. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you guys so, so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Everyone Thank have a good you. night. You too.